Good afternoon. Today I'm going to read chapter 13 of The Christian Archetype, a Jungian commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger. The beginning quote by C.G. Jung is as follows. Pentecost. Origen said of the three persons that the Father is the greatest and the Holy Spirit the least. This is true inasmuch as the Father, by descending from the cosmic immensity, became the least by incarnating himself within the narrow bounds of the human soul. The littleness of the Holy Spirit stems from the fact that God's pneuma dissolves into the form of little flames, remaining nonetheless intact and whole. His dwelling in a certain number of human individuals and their transformation into the sons of God signifies a very important step forward beyond Christocentrism. On the level of the sun, there is no answer to the question of good and evil. There is only an incurable separation of the opposites. It seems to me to be the Holy Spirit's task and charge to reconcile and reunite the opposites in the human individual through a special development of the human soul. That quote is from Dr. Jung's letter to Père Lachat. It's found in Symbolic Life, Collected Works, 18 paragraphs, 1552 and following. I've also read the entire letter into this YouTube channel on the playlist, The New God Image. This image appears at the beginning of the chapter, and its title is Pentecost from the Trerisch Ir of Jean, Duke of Berry. Scripture says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue? Wherein were we born? Parthenians, and Medes, and Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and in Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia, Phry Phrygia, and Pamphylia in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Serene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. Acts 2. 1 through 13. And I'm still reading from chapter 13 of The Christian Archetype, a Union commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger. With Pentecost, the incarnation cycle comes full circle. It began with the descent of the Holy Spirit at the Annunciation. After going through the cycle of events that make up the life of Christ, the Holy Spirit returned in the ascension to its origin. Now it descends again, and a new cycle begins, as shown in the diagram opposite. During Christ's life, the Holy Spirit manifested itself in him. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and anointed with it at his baptism. When he ascended, he took the Holy Spirit with him, so to speak, leaving the earth deprived of the transcendent factor. 
He predicted, however, that after he left, the Holy Spirit would return. Quote, it is for your own good that I am going, because unless I go, the advocate, paraclete, will not come to you. But if I do go, I will send him to you. John 16, 7, the Jerusalem Bible. I shall ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, paraclete, to be with you forever that spirit of truth whom the world can never receive since it neither sees nor knows him. But you know him because he is with you. He is in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come back to you. In a short time, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live and you will live. On that day, you will understand that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. John 14, 16 to 20. Christ, as a particular concrete manifestation of the Holy Spirit, must die in order for the disciples to develop an individual relation to the Holy Spirit. That is, the projection must be withdrawn. This is the very important step forward beyond Christocentrism. This step did not take place at the death of Christ. The individual did not become the vessel for the Holy Spirit. Instead, a collective container, the church, emerged as vessel of the Holy Ghost. Pentecost is considered to be the birthday of the church. According to Pope Leo, quote, the church which already conceived came forth from the very side of the second Adam, when he was, as it were, sleeping upon the cross, first showed herself in a marvelous manner before the eyes of men on the great day of Pentecost. Unquote. The central presence of the Virgin Mary in the conventional representations of Pentecost, which has no scriptural basis, is considered to stand for the church. The development of a community of believers serves to protect the individual from the onslaught of a private encounter with the numinosum. Thus, the church does not expect and dare not countenance any new or individual revelations. According to its teaching, quote, the Holy Ghost mission to the church is to ensure the safe custody of an unchanging revelation. For after the death of the apostles, no new economy or new revelation was to be expected, and further, that there never has been nor will be any objective increase in revealed truth, unquote. Those quotes are from The Teaching of the Catholic Church by George D. Smith, volume 1, page 159. The Church, as the body of Christ, had its Annunciation and Conception at Pentecost. It was then fated to repeat the sequence of events that constitute the Incarnation Cycle, concluding in its own death and ascension. This prospect is apparently not unknown among theologians, but it is projected onto the last day. The Catholic theologian Rudolf Rainer explained it to Jung this way, quote, The fundamental idea of the theologians is always this. That is to say, the church, in the course of her history, moves towards a death until the last day when, after fulfilling her earthly task, she becomes unnecessary and dies, as indicated in Psalm 71, 7 until the moon shall fail. These ideas were expressed in the symbolism of Luna as the church, just as the kenosis of Christ was fulfilled in death. Even so it is with the parallel kenosis of Ecclesia Luna. Unquote. If the death of the church can be postponed to the last day, then, as Jung says, quote, the man who is not particularly bold will thank God that the Holy Spirit does not concern himself with us overmuch. One feels much safer under the shadow of the church 
which serves as a fortress to protect us against God and his spirit. It is very comforting to be assured by the Catholic Church that it possesses the spirit, who assists regularly at its rites. Then one knows that he is well chained up. If, however, the Church is destined to complete its incarnation cycle sometime before the last day, then we can expect the cycle to be circled once again, perhaps this time with the individual as the vessel of the Holy Spirit. This brings us to Jung's idea of continuing incarnation. Quote, the continuing direct operation of the Holy Ghost on those who are called to be God's children implies, in fact, a broadening process of incarnation. Christ, the Son begotten by God, is the firstborn who is succeeded by an ever-increasing number of younger brothers and sisters. These are, however, neither begotten by the Holy Ghost nor born of a virgin. Their lowly origin, possibly from the mammals, does not prevent them from entering into a close relationship with God as their father and Christ as their brother. There is a continued and progressive divine incarnation. Thus, man is received and integrated into the divine drama. He seems destined to play a decisive part in it. That is why he must receive the Holy Spirit. I look upon the receiving of the Holy Spirit as a highly revolutionary fact, which cannot take place until the ambivalent nature of the Father is recognized. If God is the summum bonum, the incarnation makes no sense, for a good God could never produce such hate and anger that his only son had to be sacrificed to appease it. A midrash says that the shofar is still sounded on the Day of Atonement to remind Yahweh of his act of injustice towards Abraham by compelling him to slay Isaac and to prevent him from repeating it. A conscientious clarification of the idea of God would have consequences as upsetting as they are necessary. They would be indispensable for an interior development of the Trinitarian drama and of the role of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is destined to be incarnate in man or to choose him as a transitory dwelling place. Non habet nomum proprium, says St. Thomas, because he will receive the name of man. That is why he must not be identified with Christ. We cannot receive the Holy Spirit unless we have accepted our own individual life as Christ accepted his. Thus we become the sons of God, fated to experience the conflict of the divine opposites, represented by the crucifixion. And again, the footnote for this chapter comes from the letter to Père Lachat, and which I did read into the YouTube channel under the playlist entitled The New God Image. Okay, so that is chapter 13. And we have but one more chapter, which is the Assumption and Coronation of Mary. And so that will be interesting because that's the, the imminence of the feminine. Miles asked, did the Catholic teaching say nothing new will be learned after Pentecost and the Roman Catholic Church. I think that's what it said, but you'll have to listen to this again, I think. And Winston's mom says, three things are necessary for the salvation of man. To know what he ought to believe, to know what he ought to desire, and to know what he ought to do. Thomas Aquinas, that's fair enough. We all need that. Miles says, I suppose I can agree, but say that a lot of theologians are blinded by Christ-centrism. Yes, absolutely. And in answer to Job, Dr. Young specifically mentioned that Protestant theologians can't budge off the supremacy of Jesus Christ. But the reality is that that wasn't the intention in truth. And we have to think about that and 
come to terms with the fact that Christ wants to be our brother, not some God up in the sky, but has no reality in our life. Thank you for joining me today.